it's Sunday night, and we're studying on demons. We don't believe in demons around here. We believe the most evil thing in man is himself. We believe that demons are self. Jesus said so. When the man had the unclean spirit in Mark, the first chapter, Jesus rebuked him. Jesus rebuked A-U-T-O. It's pronounced auto. That omega is pronounced just like our word O, auto. And an automobile is self-mobile. This word auto is self. It's masculine and gender singular. Singular. When you find an unclean spirit, that is called a demon by definition because in Mark 1, this is a man that Jesus meets in the temple. That's Mark's account. Luke's account is in Luke 4. And the man is said to have an unclean daemonion. And that is our word demon. And it means to, it comes from the root dio, D-A-I-O, means to distribute fortunes. That's amazing since the love of money is the root of all evil. To distribute fortunes. There's no such thing as demons. Demons are self. Everything that people said in the Bible is not necessarily true. The Bible is true that it says those things. But when people would say something, they would say, I have a demon in me. Where did they get that information? Did they go to some university and get a doctorate in demonology? No. Their society said the world was filled with all kinds of demons and spirits and fantasies, and they were involved in their imagination. They were involved in legend. When a man wants to leave a legacy, legacy comes from legend. He wants to be a legend in the world. When a president goes down in history, he wants to be a legend. He wants to do some things for the nation Back in the 1800s, all the presidents wanted to annex everything they could for the United States. Well, they would do all kinds of seedy deals and get underhanded, and they would get into uh, doing things that were very unethical. Let me read to you the word legend out of... We're going to talk about legends tonight. Legend. A legend comes from the word logic. Logic is from the word logos, but logos can be good or evil. Logos is the word word. Jesus said he was the word of God. He was the logos of God. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. The same was in the beginning with God. But a logos, small l-o-g-o-s, that's a word. And this word legend or legacy, legend actually means... Listen to what the definition is and see if you recognize it. A story handed down for generations among a people and popularly believed to have a historical basis, although not verifiable. What does that sound like? Sounds like the halakha, doesn't it? It's something that's passed down from generation to generation but they cannot verify it. Well, that was the halakha of the Pharisees, wasn't it? So whenever you're talking about legend, you're talking about a halakha, something that's been passed down that has no foundation in truth. Now, we do not believe that demons are the fallen angels. I've got that up here. Why fallen angels are not demons. Let's go over to, we've said that we're talking about the doctrine of demons or doctrines of devils. In the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of daemonion. Now, some people try to say in the sixth chapter of Genesis that these these sons of God are fallen angels. And that is totally 
utterly impossible for this to be true. I'm going to show you why. In the New Testament, when you find the word angel, it's the word A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Angel is this word. A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Two G's pronounced angelos or angel. They've translated to angel. The word means messenger. Now, God's messengers, on the whole, have always been male. His pastors were male. All the pastors of the churches were called angels because they were messengers. Angel is the common word for messenger. In the Old Testament, whenever the, one of the angels, one of the heavenly angels, heavenly messengers would come, it was always a male, Michael or Gabriel. And all of the angels were named male names. Now, every time you find the word angel in the Greek, it is masculine gender. Masculine means male, a man, a boy. Anything that has masculine to it, that was what an angel was. And when you find the word daemonion or demon, it is always neuter gender. Neuter gender is something that's neither male nor female. Oh, hmm. Look over there in the 22nd chapter of Matthew very quickly. 22nd chapter of Matthew. Now, the Sadducees are arguing with Jesus about the resurrection. You see, the Sadducees didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. If they believed in anything, it would be a spiritual resurrection, but not a bodily resurrection. Now, when, you, when he's talking to these, Pharisees, these Sadducees, they say, well, if a man has a uh, wife and he dies and his brother marries her, and it was the custom of the Jew for a surviving brother to marry his, his deceased brother's wife and raise up children to his brother. And the Sadducees said, if a man is married to this, uh, this woman is married to a man and he dies, and his brother marries the same woman, and he dies, and, he, and the other brother marries the same woman, and he dies up to seven brothers. In the resurrection, in verse 28, Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her sexually. And Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. These are heavenly messengers in heaven. They'll be as the angels. They're not going to be male or female when we get to heaven. There'll only be one female as far as we're concerned, and that'll be the wife, the bride of Christ. But the Bible doesn't teach that we'll have sexual genitalia in heaven. What's that for? That's for reproduction. Since when they say these angels supposedly by a lot of theologians that these angels in the sixth chapter are these sons of God or angels fallen out of heaven and they become demons. We don't believe that. It's not, that's not possible. But as the touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken of by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, there's neither going to be male nor female, the Scripture tells us, in Christ Jesus in Colossians, the third chapter. There's neither male nor female. We're going to be like the angels, which are not, the angels are male, but they're not male in the sense of having sexual reproductive organs. They're male because they are the messenger of God. Now, what would God have why would he have angels? They would have to actually have to have the same sexual makeup as a human being in order to breed with women. That is a fairy tale. In order to come together with a woman, 
the sperm of an angel would have to be able to fertilize the egg of a woman. That sounds ridiculous because you don't even see animals doing that out here in, out here in the forest. That's not common. It's not natural at all. Now let's go over here to Genesis, the sixth chapter. Where did this doctrine, this theology come from that when the angels fell from heaven, when, when Michael the archangel, we'll have to read that, I guess. Let me, let me just read this to you. The, here's the fallen angels in Revelation, the 12th chapter. Let's read that and then we'll come back here. Revelation, the 12th chapter. This is where the angels are fallen. Revelation. Angels can't be demons. Angels are masculine. Demons are neuter. You can't... Neuter gender is a thing that has no male or female gender to it. A thing is a car. It's a table. It's a wall. That's a thing. You can't call a... Demon, a she or a he. You call an angel a he, but you can't call a demon. People think the angels that fell from heaven are demons. Angels that fell from heaven are real. Demons are not real. They're man's imagination. You cannot connect. Whenever I say there's no such thing as demons, let me write something on the board. Satan... Diabolos Demonion. Whenever I say there's no such thing as demons, it doesn't mean there's no Diabolos. That is another word. Both these words have been translated into uh, devil in the King James Bible. Devil or devils. Demonion is only a result of diabolos. When a man casts God out of his life or he traduces and he leads people astray, he gets them involved in daemonion. But Satan is not the same thing as demon. Satan is real. Satan had to be a being talking to Eve in the garden. We see that in, in Babylon that Lucifer... Lucifer is mentioned one time in the Bible. That's in the 14th chapter of Isaiah. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? But Lucifer is a term or a title for Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. This is a proverb against the king of Babylon. When he said, I will be like the most high, I will ascend above the sides of the north. Thou shalt be brought down to the pit. Belshazzar, that is who Lucifer is. Get Lucifer out of your mind that that's Satan. He's only Satan in one sense. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, you find two men. The king of Babylon the king of Babylon or the last king was Belshazzar And the prince of Tyre, prince of Tyre, these two men are equated with Satan himself only in the sense that they kept the fire and tree worship alive in the world. And this is the Babylonian system, fire and tree. And these are the only two men that are considered to be, in a sort of a sense, satanically possessed. Only in the sense that Satan, in the Hebrew, the word is satanas, S-A-T-A-N-A-S, and that means adversary. Boy, we sure do need to get these words out of our mind. If there is a Satan, and I believe there is, because he was cast out of heaven by Mark of the archangel. There is a Satan. He was talking to Eve in the garden. Is, wasn't Satan talking to Jesus in Matthew, the fourth chapter, and Luke 4, when Jesus was in the wilderness and said, command these stones to be made bread? Do I believe there's a being called Satan? Yes, I believe that. It's the adversary of God. I've wrestled with this for a lot of years. A lot of people try to say, well, that's just self. Well, it certainly is involved in self because when Satan was cast into the earth, 
He corrupted all the universe, corrupted all the dust, corrupted the moon. The Bible says the moon's not clean in his sight. The stars are not clean. Therefore, everything in this great sphere that we live in was corrupted by Satan. But I believe it was an individual that dwelt in the garden of God there in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. He was beauty until, in fact, I guess we ought to read that, shouldn't we? Read Ezekiel. Look in Ezekiel. Boy, this is so much to get to. Now, people who want to make out these things, look in Ezekiel. Let's just look at this. I want to verify these things as we go. Ezekiel, the 14th, the 28th chapter, excuse me, 14th chapter of Isaiah. 28th chapter. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, or Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Now, the prince of Tyre, Tyre was in the midst of the seas. When you look over here at, you look at, Israel's right here. Here's Lebanon up here. Lebanon had a capital city in the ancient world. That was Tyre and Sidon. And the capital city of Tyre did like so. And here's Israel down here. The capital city it wasn't that big compared to the land, but it was like it was out in the midst of the seas. And the way it became in the midst of the seas at one time, there was no land bridge out there. It just sat out there. That was Tyre. When Alexander the Great came from over here in Greece, and he came eastward conquering all these nations, Babylon and all the rest of it, and, and, and uh, Persia, he came down here to attack Tyre. When he got there, he couldn't get out over the sea there to, the, to Tyre, so he took a million soldiers, or how many ever he had, th hundreds of thousands of them, and built up this here a little bit at a time, put all these rocks and stone and dirt, till he built a bridge out there, and he could get in there and conquer Tyre. That's how he conquered Tyre. You can actually get your McClinic and Strong and look up Tyre, and it'll show you that Tyre was in the midst of the seas. That's why it says here uh, that that he dwells in the midst of the seas. Which verse was I in? I, said in the, I, sit, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. That's what he's talking about. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that I can hide from thee. Now this is talking about the prince of Tyre. I believe it's talking about Ethbaal, Jezebel's father. Now, when you go further down here, let's go on down into the uh, 13th verse. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, we know that Belshazzar was, uh, excuse me. We know that uh, uh, the prince of Tyre wasn't in the garden, but what was possessing him was in the garden of God. God is speaking to the prince of Tyre who is possessed with Satan because he is causing the fire and tree worship, which is the essence of Babylon to continue. The two hot spots for fire and tree worship in the ancient world, the two systems that kept it going was Tyre and Babylon. When you look at that 13th chapter of Isaiah, right before he talks about Lucifer, it talks about the destruction of Babylon in that 13th chapter. Then he goes on to say here in this chapter, verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, of thy pipes, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. God did the setting. God put a glitch in him so he would fall. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created 
till iniquity was found in thee. Now that's where Satan falls. Now let's look at let's look at Isaiah the fourteenth chapter. Isaiah fourteen. This is very abstract terminology. Satan was certainly possessing the prince of Tyre and all the princes thereafter because they kept this Babylonian fire worship alive and well in the world at that time, that they were at the top of the world. They were one of the controlling factors in the world concerning fire and tree worship or bell and grove worship or Christmas, whatever you want to call it. And the same thing goes for Babylon. Babylon is where it all originated. Go back to the 14th chapter of Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14. Now in 13, you can see over here in verse 17 of chapter 13, I will stir up the Medes against them, speaking of the Chaldeans, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces. Now the Medes was a was a dual empire with the Persians, and they're the ones that conquered Babylon. And they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb, their eyes shall not spare children, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And he goes on to say that this, will, this place will never be inhabited again in the next two verses. Then you go over here to the 14th chapter, and he talks directly to the king of Babylon, who was the last king. In that fifth chapter of Daniel, the Bible says Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon. What well, he says here in verse 4 of chapter 14, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. Speaking of in the 13th chapter, the destruction of Babylon, and Belshazzar's the last king. And he says, against the king of Babylon, say, how hath the presser ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of wickedness and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted. He's talking about Belshazzar who was a slaughtering butcher and none hindereth. The whole earth, whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. When he was conquered by Persia, the Persians came in down the riverbed, as we've said so many times. They diverted the river right above Babylon, out into the Arabian desert. You can find that in Herodotus. You can find that in the 44th and 45th chapter of Isaiah. They diverted the river out here into the Arabian desert, marched down the riverbed, came in the two leaf gates there in Isaiah 45, and Herodotus just tells us the same thing. He's the father of history. And they take Belshazzar that night and they execute him that night. So he goes on to say here in the 14th chapter, uh, the whole earth is at rest in verse 7 and is quiet. They break forth in singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon sang. Since thou art laid down, king of Babylon, Belshazzar, this fire worship is no longer here anymore, and you're not cutting down trees to worship trees any longer. No feller, it don't mean fellow, don't mean, hey, look at that feller over there. No, it don't mean that. A feller of trees. No feller of trees has come up against us. This is the trees figuratively saying, we won't be cut down to be worshipped anymore now that Belshazzar is being destroyed. Hell from beneath is moved from thee to meet thee at thy coming. Now all of this is a proverb against the king of Babylon according to verse 4, isn't it? It's against the king of Babylon and the last king was Belshazzar. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, all they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we, Belshazzar? Now you're cut down. Now Cyrus has come in and arrested you, and he's going to execute you. Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp, Belshazzar, king of Babylon, is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread 
under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Only place it's mentioned. The context is a proverb against the king of Babylon, isn't it? And he kept this fire and tree worship alive and well. Flourishing in his days. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground? You mean Satan is cut down back here? No. Belshazzar is cut down. Lucifer is the word H-E-Y-L-E-L. It is a derivative of H-A-L-L-A-L. And halal, we say halal. Hallelujah. Halal, Jah. Jah is short for Jehovah. Halal means to shine or boast. And only the halal belongs to God. Boast. To shine or boast. And Belshazzar is taking the glory in shining, calling himself Lucifer. Is he possessed by Satan? Yes. Lucifer is a, ter- is a name for Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, the shining one. How art thou cut down from the ground which just weakened the nations? He weakened the nations because he was the king of Babylon, the largest, most powerful system in the world uh, while he was reigning. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I am the great Belshazzar. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now let's go to, let's go to Revelation 12. Were they possessed with Satan? Yes, but that's not talking about just Satan as an individual. That's talking about Belshazzar being possessed with Satan, corrupting the world with let us make us a name and self. The fire and tree worship. Now go to Revelation, the 12th chapter. Let's just read verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. This dragon has seven heads and ten horns from verse 3. It's the same thing as the beast world system. Chapter 13, verse 1, seven heads and ten horns. Don't, not, don't have time to go through the heads and the horns. A head was a capital city of an empire. Then he says, And prevail not, neither was their place found any more in heaven for the dragon. Dracon. Meaning to enchant. To make people feel good. The great dragon was cast out of heaven. That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now these are the fallen angels here. These are not fallen angels over here in Genesis, the sixth chapter. Absolutely not. It's just ridiculous what people are saying. Let's go to the sixth chapter of Genesis. I'm trying to lay this out for you. This is a fairy tale. It's a legend. Oop, I'm going to get water, excuse me. This is a legend. I heard this, I guess, 35, 40 years ago. It's the same angel in 2 Peter. Um, that's right. We're going to get to that. All right, sixth chapter. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Now people say these sons of God are the fallen angels. That's ridiculous. Some say the fallen angels are the demons of the world. Demons and fallen angels have nothing to do with each other. That's like a cow and, and a Martian. They don't have anything to do with each other. Demons are imaginary. Fallen angels, we find them in that 12th chapter. 
the 12th chapter of Revelation is a panoramic view of all time. Pan means all, then the God of all in the old ancient pagan world was Pan. And when you pan an audience, you get the whole audience with a camera. Or you pan things, you look at everything. Now, and the Lord said, uh, These sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Then God says, He uses a verse that all the Baptist preachers I have around, they would sing 25 verses of Just As I Am, and then they'd sing 15 more of Almost Persuaded, trying to beg people down the aisle to accept Christ, which you can't do. The natural man does not receive or accept spiritual things. The Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man. And I've heard that by my father and all of his friends, and they'll say, Let's sing one more verse. Just as I... Won't you come tonight? Won't you come? The Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man. That has nothing to do with invitation hymns in churches. God says, I'm not going to wrestle over this thing that's going on between the sons of God and the daughters of men. I'm not going to constantly put up with sons of God. Now, what did we learn earlier? Sons of God. Daughters of men. I'm not going to put up with these sons of God marrying daughters of men. First of all, angels neither marry nor are given in marriage, do they? So if they, if they go into these women, even if they could go into them and have a sexual relationship with them, which it will be utterly impossible... If they could do this, they'd have to do it outside of marriage, wouldn't they? Because angels don't marry. I don't believe they procreate either. Now, there can't be any such thing as demons doing anything bad. The Bible says so. God says, is there evil in a city and I have not done it? So God does the evil, doesn't he? Not demons. If there were demons, they'd be like Casper the friendly ghost. They'd be demons the friendly demon. Casper the friendly demon. It would be demons going around and say, Hi, how you doing? Because evil comes from God, not demons. And not fallen angels. It's, if you look at things mathematically here, it can't mean what these people are saying. Then he goes on to say, my spirit will not always strive with men, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. So he's saying, after the flood, I'm going to cut his days down to 120. And then later on, he says, man's days are three score and ten. That's 70. If you live past that, you're considered living under grace, or you have your days extended. Then he says, there were giants in the earth in those days. It doesn't say giants in heaven. Now, all of the fairy tales, all of the legendary stories out of every civilization and culture comes out of this imagination that sons of God are fallen angels. If they're fallen and Michael is casting them out of heaven, they can't be doing the will of the Father, can they? You only call a son of someone, son of, if that person does the will of the Father. Beloved, 1 John 3 and 1. Will of the faith. Huh? Will of the faith. Will of the, will of the Father. <laughs> Father. And they have to be doing the will of the Father. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. 1 John 3 and 1. We are sons of God, aren't we? What did Jesus say in the third chapter of Mark? He was in a house and a messenger came in and said, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside the house. They can't get in. There's too many people. And he said, who is my mother and my brothers and my sister? Now, he was a son of God. He was the son of God. 
And if he had brothers and sisters, they would be sons of God, wouldn't they? He said, my brothers and sisters are those who do the will of the Father. Isn't that right? You have to be doing the will. Your Father is the one who you do His will. In John 8, the Pharisees were arguing with Jesus. And they were saying, our father's Abraham. Well, look at that quickly in John 8. Just look at it because we've got to verify this as we go along. John 8. All right. Notice who Jesus says the Pharisees are. Now, the Pharisees certainly were descendants of Abraham's sperm or Abraham's seed. They were certainly that, but Jesus says it takes more than that to be a son. Did he say that? He says you have to be doing what the Father says to be called a son. You can have a, a man that's a drunk and he's a drug head and he's got a child and... He gives him up for adoption, and this other man can raise him and teach him right and teach him wrong and teach him godliness and teach him holiness. But that man that fathered him, as far as the seed, he's not his father. The one that, according to the Bible, the one's the father, and yet the one is a son according to the will that he does. That's what Paul said. Know ye not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are to whom you obey. You're a son of the man you obey. And he says here in John 8, the Pharisees are arguing with him. And he's talking about, he's talking to them about them saying, uh, Abraham is their father. Well, look here in verse 34. When they said, we're not in bondage, we've never been in bondage to anybody in verse 33. And Jesus answered them, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you'll be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's sperm, seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. He's talking about what you do determines who your father is. I speak that which I have seen with my father, well, see, Jehovah was Jehovah God, or God the Father was the father of Jesus. And the Pharisees were saying that was their father. And they were sons of, of the God of the Old Testament. And you do that which you have seen with your father. Notice the word do. You do. I put ye do in yellow. Mark highlighter there. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. We're sons of Abraham. We're children of Abraham by faith, Galatians, the third chapter tells us. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, if you were sons of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. Right there is showing you that you got to do the works of a father to be called a son, don't you? If Abraham were your father, this has nothing to do with the seed. I know his seed is in you. I know generations back... You came from him physically, but you're not sons of Abraham. But you seek to kill me, a man that told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This is, did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, we're not born of fornication. What are you talking about? That we, were, we had some father outside of, in an illegitimate relationship. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, and if you were sons of God, isn't that the same thing? If God were your father, if you were sons of God, you would love Jesus. Can fallen angels be loving Jesus? No, they can't be sons of God. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot Hear my word. You are of your father the devil. You're sons of, of the devil. You're not sons of God. Anybody who's fallen and does not do the truth is not a son of God. That pretty well nails it down, doesn't it? 
and the lust of your father you will do. What you do determines who your father is. And, he had, and Christ has to put that desire to do for God. He was a murderer. So are you. That's what he was saying to them. They said a son inherited the office of his father in the first century. You are your father. That's the devil. He was a murderer. So are you. And they were. Didn't they murder Jesus? They, Jesus said they murdered the prophets. Under the guise of Pharisees or rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. And there's not any in you because you got all this halakha. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own sons. You can just put sons in there. For he is a liar, so are you, and the father of it, and the father of lies, and you're a liar, you've got the halakha. Notice how much he's saying in this that he's, that's not written down. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. And which of you persuades me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God, or he that is a son of God, heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not sons of God. That's what he's saying. You're not of God. All through there, he's telling who a father and a son is, isn't he? So when you back up over here to Genesis 6 and 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. The word giant is the word Nephilim. N-E-P-H-I-Y. P-H-I-Y-L-I-M. N-P-H-A-L-I-Y-M. I'll get it right in a minute. Nephilim, or I-Y-M. Nephilim means a bully or tyrant. Now, you can be a bully and be six foot ten or seven foot nine, or you can be a bully or tyrant, but what makes you a bully or a tyrant is not how big you are. Napoleon was like five seven. Was he a bully? Oh, yes, he wanted to conquer the world. When you, what he's saying here, when sons of God are those who are doing the will of the Father, married daughters of men. Daughters are sisters of the sons of men. When you look at the two previous chapters, when you look at the previous chapters, chapter 4 is the lineage of Cain. Cain's lineage does not go back to Adam or to God. It goes back to man. I believe that Cain was a result when Adam looked at Eve and he took Eve. When, a, when they ate of the tree and then they knew they were naked. When you take a naked man and a naked woman in a situation like this and they look at each other, what happens? They get together in copulation. This is where I believe that Cain was conceived because Cain is not numbered in the lineage of God. When you look at the sons of God, look at the sons of God in chapter 5. Chapter 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them, and blessed them and called their name Adam, which is man, in the day in which they were created. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son. God has a son and calls his name Adam. Adam has a son. This is the lineage of the sons of God. These have the approval of God. When you take this lineage, starting with Adam, go through Seth, go all the way down through Enosh and Canaan and Mahalalel and Jared, and you go all the way down here and go to Genesis 11 chapter and you start with Shem's son or Faxed and it takes you on down to Serug and, and uh, Reu and all of these guys. It takes you down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the sons of God here because you can get take Adam all the way back to God. And if you'll notice in that fifth chapter, Cain is nowhere mentioned. 
And he's still alive here at this point. He's not a son of God. He offered the works of his hands, didn't he? He said, here's my sacrifice. It's all this corn and wheat that I planted, and I brought you a sacrifice, and Abel brought a blood sacrifice. So when you see Cain is not mentioned, you can trace this lineage back to God. These are sons of God. These are believers. When you go back to the previous chapter, chapter 4, and it gives Cain's lineage. Cain knew his wife in verse 17, and she bare a son called his name Enoch. This is another Enoch. There's also an Enoch in the fifth chapter. And then Enoch was born arid, but you don't have Cain in a lineage that goes back to God. These are the pagans. These are sons of men. Fifth chapter is sons of God. This has God's blessing on it all the way down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when you have the sons of God marrying the daughters of men, of men, what you have is you have truth marrying a lie. And when you marry truth to a lie, you end up with a Nephilim, a bully or a tyrant. When they married truth to a lie in these churches, they married Christmas to Jesus. And Christmas is Christ's mass, it's Roman Catholicism, and it comes out of paganism. When they've married accept Christ, which is the same thing as accept the Eucharist, walk down the aisle, that's Roman Catholicism. They married it to the what used to be the conservative Baptist believers in America 150 years ago that believed in predestination, believed Christmas was pagan. They married truth to a lie. If you try to go into one of these churches and talk to one of these preachers about this, well, we don't have that here. Now, Mr. Brown, you're going to have to leave if you're going to stir trouble. That's a bully. That's a tyrant. And they will not allow you to question their doctrines. You go to that church, don't you question what we believe here. You sit there and behave yourself. If not, you have to leave. That is a tyrant. That's a giant. When you marry truth or lie, you have that all through the Scriptures. In the 22nd chapter, Genesis 22nd chapter, Abraham was living over here, down here in Beersheba, in Israel. And he tells Eliezer, his servant, don't you dare marry my son Isaac to any of these women in Canaan. You go to the land of my fathers and get my son a believing wife. I do not want to intermix my son, Isaac, with one of these women here. God has a believer over here in the land of Haran. And he went over there. Eliezer did in that 22nd chapter. And Abraham said, the woman that comes out and waters the camels, that'll be the one. And the woman came out. Water the camels, and that was Rebekah. And he married Rebekah, and she had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And that lineage continues. Now, in a pro let's, go, let's continue reading. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord... Where was I? I missed. I lost my place. Abel brought of the firstling of his flock, of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel. Well, I'm in, I'm in the wrong chapter. Excuse me. I'm at the sixth chapter. Sixth chapter. Let's continue reading. There were giants in the earth in those days, in verse 4, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, when chapter 5 came into chapter 4, When the sons of God are chapter 5, the believers started intermarrying with these daughters of men because they were gorgeous. Cain had some beautiful daughters. And they said, we like those women. We don't care what they believe. When the Bible says, come out and be separate and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, rebuke them. That's what this is talking about. Repeatedly, God would say to Israel, 
Do not give your daughters to the sons of these pagans, nor marry these sons to your daughters. Because if you do, they will go after their gods. That's sons of God marrying daughters of men. That's called a mixed marriage. Has nothing to do with black marrying white or white marrying red. Nothing to do with that. It has to, and this is the very verses that people use all through the Old Testament. This is what the clan uses to say don't intermarry races. God's not talking about intermarrying races. He's talking about intermarrying believers to unbelievers. It says that in Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter. Now let's go on and continue reading. There were giants in the earth in those days. Also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. The word renown is Shem. Remember that word? Let us make us a Shem. Let us make us a name. Let us make us an authority. They were men of authority. When you marry truth to a lie, that worldly side of, they like to keep just enough truth in their message so they can keep drawing people away and deceiving them. That's the daughters of men marrying the sons of God. That has nothing to do with fallen angels. Where did this come from? And people try to come up. Let me show you something before I read out of a book here. Go over to Job, the first chapter. Job. Huh? Job, the first chapter. Now, people will come up and say these sons of God. If you're a son of God, you... You have to be doing the will of the Father. What happened? These believers started marrying unbelief. And Abraham says, I don't want my son marrying unbelievers. He says the same thing in Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter. He says it all through the scriptures. Let me move this book over here. All right. Now. I'm just thumbing through here, y'all. Excuse me. Okay. Now, where did I say we was going to go? Oh, Job. Job, first chapter. Esther, Job. All right. First chapter, Job. These people that try to preach this, sons of God or fallen angels, that's ridiculous. They'll say, you know why they say that? Well, these angels are going to pollute... The bloodline of Christ. First of all, they were supposed to be giants. They were 3,000 L's, E-L-L-S, high. I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute, okay? Now here in Job, first chapter 6 verse, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And people say, see, that's demons. That's fallen angels. Now, what would God be doing talking to somebody that's rebellious? And how were they presenting themselves? If they were sons of God, they had to be believers, didn't they? And how were they presenting themselves to God? I believe they were presenting themselves to God in prayer and supplication and giving offerings to God. But while this was happening... While the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. They're saying, see Satan, their leader, and he's there with them. Well, if God's people come to him in prayer and supplication, and back then they offered a sacrifice, does that mean Satan is leading the sons of God? How could he be leading the sons of God when he's not a father to them and they're not doing the will of Satan? I believe this is where they're coming to God in prayer or coming to Him in worship, it don't mean they're going up into heaven somewhere and walking in the corridors of heaven and say, God, we're here. If we present ourselves as sons of God to the Lord, don't we go to Him in prayer and in worship here? So they use this and they come up and say, see, uh, Satan, their leader, is coming with them. And that's ridiculous. Well, all through the Scripture, look here in Deuteronomy. Look in Deuteronomy, 7th chapter. 
all through the Old Testament. He says this constantly. Seventh chapter. Verse chapter 7, verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, their pagans, their unbelievers, their sons of men, Gergesites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, these are all sons of men, aren't they? They're all unbelievers. Hittites, Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, when the Lord thy God shall deliver them from before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Why? Because they're not as good as you? They're another race? No. They're unbelievers. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Why? Because they're black and Israel's whatever color they were. Or because they were red or yellow and they were different races. No. He tells you why. Thy daughter shalt not give unto the, his son or his daughter unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me. Double underline that. That they may serve other gods. That's the whole point. Do I believe in black marrying white and brown marrying red if they're both believers? Two people come to me and say, I'm a, we're both believers. I don't care what color you are. They ain't got nothing to do with nothing. I mean, if you're circumcised with the heart, you're my brother and my sister. My brothers and sisters are those who do the will of the Father. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly because you're going after their gods. How many times does God say that to the Old Testament? Dozens and dozens and dozens of times said the same thing whenever he, when Ezra came back in that 457 B.C. to bring that third decree to supply the temple. He came back and he found Israel intermang with these pagans in the land. He said, get rid of your pagan wives in Ezra the 10th chapter. If they want to believe they can stay, but you get rid of them and your, those children. I told you not to intermarry with them. Now Israel is going after their gods. That's what it's about. That's the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. It's not fallen angels or not demons. Demons don't exist. They're self. Well, there's something involved there. What will really get you involved in demons is sons of God, truth marrying a lie, and then you'll be into yourself won't you? That's the only demon that's involved there. Where did hap what happened to these fallen angels? Go to first, go to second Peter, the second chapter. Here's what happened to the fallen angels. Second Peter, second chapter. People do not study this. It's just, it's outrageous to say sons of God are fallen angels. Remember, angel is masculine, demon is neuter. You can't call a table she. You see that table? She needs to sit there and quit falling over. Can you? My car, he won't, he won't start in the morning. A car's not a he. It's a neuter gender. It's an it. All right, second meter. <clears throat> That's what people are saying when they say demons are angels and angels are demons. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> verse 2, chapter 2, second Peter. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. These are the evil men that deny the Lord God that has bought us. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned. Here's the fallen angels, aren't they? Here they are. And where are they? It tells you right here. But cast them down to hell, 
and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Reserved is the word tereo. It means to guard. God has put a guard on Tartarus. T-A-R-T-A-R-A-S. Tartarus, when you look, that's the only time that word is used in all the Bible. Tartarus was the lowest pit of hell. The Bible says that the fallen angels are in Tartarus. They're kept, they're guarded, and it means to be unchanged. They cannot come and inhabit you as demons. They're unchanged, unchangeable. They're reserved in hell for the day of judgment. That's where the fallen angels are. It is Satan that goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's cast into the earth. Satan fell from heaven to the earth. As lightning, the scripture says in Luke, the 18th chapter. He fell from heaven. But this has nothing to do with demons. So they're reserved unto judgment. So they're already in, they're locked in Tartarus. That word tereo means to guard against loss. They can't be changed. They can't inhabit anybody. They're not demons. They're beings. Where did all this stuff come from? Well, where did that story about fallen angels come from? Right here. This is a seven-volume set. I only brought four volumes. This is called Legends. Remember we talked about legends a while ago? Legends of the Jews by Ginsburg. This is a seven-volume set. This is where the fallen angels, this is connected to Halakha and Haggadah. It comes out of that. It's Jewish imagination. Let me read to you something here. All right. Let me just read some. Now, you may not understand some of it, but I'm just going to read it. All right. Don't know quite where to start. Talks about the angels can see the demons, but the demons cannot see angels. Sounds like so much foolishness, doesn't it? Then he goes on to say, where it is said, they live with one another like angels without hatred or envy. Now, remember, this is legend. This is imagination. Jewish imagination where all their stories come from out of the Halakha. The assertion that demons do not cast a shadow. Oh, vampires? Vampires not supposed to cast a reflection or a shadow. Remember in that fifth chapter of Acts and Peter was walking in the streets and the and they wanted to get inside of his shadow to be healed. They believed that shadows were deities. They were gods. It did, Peter didn't say they could be healed by getting in his shadow. Look up shadow in Hastings. It'll tell you they believed they were gods. That they were demons who were gods. Well, is there a shadow that is a god? No. And they believed that they, the demons did not cast a shadow. That's a vampire doesn't cast a shadow. It sounds so funny. Well, let me see if I got this paper here. I got a paper here somewhere. Uh, I don't even have time to look at everything. I've got a paper up here. And I printed it. It's out of, it's out of the Judaica. I put, here it is. Judaica. This is Jewishness. This is Encyclopedia Judaica by the Jews. It's a 17-volume set. talks about demons and demon, demonology. A demon is an evil spirit or a devil in the ordinary English usage of the term. In the ordinary English usage. But it's not talking about in the Jewish cultural background. This definition is, however, only approximate. In polytheistic religions, polytheos. Poly, many gods. Let's put it this way. In many gods' religions, 
The line between gods and demons is shifting one. There are both good demons and gods who do evil. They interchange the word God and demon even in Jewish encyclopedias. There's demons and gods that do evil. Of course, the pagans said that theos and daemonion were interchangeable, that a demon was a god. There are both good demons and gods who do evil. See, when they said there are good demons and gods who do evil, they're saying demons are gods. And how many gods are there? There's one. In monotheistic, mono, one theos. In one god systems, evil spirits may be accepted as servants of the one god. So that demonology is bound up with angelology and theology proper. And it's very confusing. I'm not going to read all this. Let me read something over here. Now, this is out of Judaica. The Israelite conception of demons as it existed in the popular mind or the literary imaginations resembled in some ways that held elsewhere. Demons lived in deserts or in ruins. Where was the man living? The man of the gatherings among the tombs, among the ruins. They inflict sickness on men. They trouble men's minds, deceive them. But nevertheless, these evil spirits are sent by the Lord. The mis- these evil spirits are sent by the Lord. Mysterious beings who attacks Jacob in Genesis thirty-two twenty-five. That wasn't a mysterious being. They're saying it was, but it was the angel of the Lord that struck Jacob down and hit him in the thigh and crippled him the rest of his life exhibits a trait which is very widespread belief associated with certain demons who are spirits of the night and must perish at dawn. A vampire? Men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Men are the vampires. We like darkness. We don't want to come into the light when we're unrepentant, do we? We like the darkness, and this goes on and on. Now, where did all this come from? Let me just read this here. On the countless numbers of demons, Barakat means this female demon, which is mentioned in Ecclesiastes 2.8, cannot be accurately determined since there are so many of them. Then he goes on to talk about as to the view found in pseudepigraphic, the pseudepigrapha is the Pseudo false graphe writings. They're not false in the sense that nobody wrote them. They're false because they didn't belong in the canon of Scripture. That's the book of Tobit, the book of Enoch, the Assumption of Moses. The early church fathers did not put them into the Scriptures. The Roman Catholics put them in there. But not the church fathers. Uh, let me go on here. As to the view found in the pseudepigraphic literature and prevalent among the church fathers according to which the demons are the descendants of the fallen angels. That's a legend. Something that does is not founded in truth. That legend that the fallen angels are the demons is a fairy tale. It's a demon tale. From their union with the daughters of men. They got it messed up, don't they? But that's legend. This, the legend of this is outrageous. Let me get another book. Let me get another book. Show you how legendary the Jews are. And when you read the prefaces on these books, it says it comes out of Halakha. It comes out of Midrash. They had an imaginary time. All right, let me read this here. I keep saying you can't just look up something in a Strong's Concordance. You've got to look at the culture of the first century. And you have to mathematically construct these things. Let me see here what I've got. All right, let me read this. Oh, this is an index volume. You can go in this index volume and look up demons. Listen to the subjects. Uh, let me see. The origin of demons, the abode of demons, uh, the user of the book of Raziel. Demons lost their fear of man after the time of Enosh. Demons cannot 
injure the recipient of the splendor of the Shekinah, demons, the king of the name of demons, demons slain by the sword of Methuselah, the names of demons could not an, injure the antediluvian babes, Solomon's dominion over demons. Remember, the, the Arabs said Solomon had dominion over the demons. And not the Arabs, the Jews said Solomon had dominion over the demons. And the Arab city had dominion over the genies. They're the same thing. Nine-tenths of the demons. Nine-tenths of, of the demons were banished from the earth. Where in the world did they come up with that? A third of them were banished from heaven, but where did they get nine-tenths? Noah's relation with demons, swayed by means of magic. Demons helped the magicians of Egypt. Demons cannot produce things smaller than a barley grain. Boy, that is imagination, isn't it? And it goes on and on. Then you can go into angels, and it gives you a list of angels. Tells you what volume to look in. Tells you what page it's on. Now, let me give you something else here. Now, let's look at these angels. Where did this all originate? Well, let me see here. All right. Let me read this. Here's where this originated. The fall of the angels. Let me read here. Where do I need to read? Under the leadership of 20 captains, they defiled themselves with the daughters of men unto whom they taught charms, conjuring formulas, how to cut roots, and the efficacy of the plants. The issue of these mixed marriages was a race of giants, 3,000 L's tall. An L is approximately... 45 inches. We get the word L bow from the word L. It meant the length of the arm, approximately 45 inches. 3,000 L's tall would be 11,200 feet high. Now, that's how tall these giants were. Now, I want to see them. I don't mean this in a crude way. I want to see him crawl into bed with a woman. About three quarters, at least two-thirds the height of Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs. The size of a large mountain. Is that ridiculous? That's where this comes from. It comes out of legends of the Jews. It's... If they are round, like I say, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. To give in marriage means to marry one thing to another thing. So when Matthew 24 says, as it was in the days of Noah, it'll be that way in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So if we're close to the end of time, there's got to be some giants walking around that are 11,200 feet tall. Intermarrying with Christian women. Like I've said, the tallest men in the world are the NBA, the NFL, the WWE of all things, World Wrestling, or WWF, that World Wrestling Federation, and the Watusis in Africa. Those are the tallest men alive that we know of. So it has to be, maybe God's cutting them short this round and he's going to let them marry Christian women. So it's got to be Shaquille O'Neal, who's seven foot two or somewhere about that, wanting to run off with my wife Mary, who's four foot eight and a half. That's how stupid this doctrine is. If it was going on in the days of Noah, the Bible says it'll be going on when Christ comes back, there'll be these gigantic angels coming down and intermarrying with women, and they'll be 11,000 feet tall. Listen to this. Who consumed the possessions of men when all had vanished and they could obtain nothing more from them, the giants turned against men and devoured many of them. They ate them. And the remnant of men began to trespass against the birds, the beasts, the reptiles, the fishes, eating their flesh and drinking their blood. Eat flesh and drink blood. Then the earth complained about the impious evildoers, but the fallen angels continued to corrupt mankind. Azazel, which is a term for the scapegoat 
in Leviticus the 16th chapter, and some say a term for Satan, taught men how to make slaughtering knives, arms, shields, and coats of mail so they can make war. That's not what's evil. What's evil is in man's heart. He showed them metals and how to work them and amulets and all sorts of trinkets and the use of rouge for the eyes and how to beautify the eyelids and how to ornament themselves with rarest and most precious jewels and all sorts of paints. The chief of the fallen angels, Shemhazi, instructed them in exorcisms and how to cut roots. <laughs> well, if they're here, they're going to have to teach us something better than that, aren't they? Amaros taught them how to raise spells, barakel, divination from the stars. These are the names of some of the fallen angels. Quakabel, astrology, Ezekiel, augury for, from the clouds, Arakiel, the signs of the earth, Samsawil, the signs of the sun, and Sariel, the signs of the moon. Does this sound ridiculous? It's because it's a legend. That's where it comes from. Now, let me read something else to you here. All right. I've got one of the angels I've got to read to you. It is funny. Oh, here. Now listen to this. Here's one of the tall angels. Now this is out of Legends of the Jews by Ginsburg. This is, this is where people are teaching in, in seminaries. They're teaching about these tall angels which were giants. You can be a giant, a Nephilim, and like I say, be a short man. You can just be a bully. Just marry truth to a lie. And that's what the Baptists are that I was raised around. They're bullying people. You don't dare to question a Baptist preacher. They'll ostracize you, cut you off from all kind of fellowship and call you names. You're a cult. Okay. This is tall angels. In the third heaven, Moses saw an angel so tall it would take a human being 500 years to climb to his height. He had 70,000 heads. 70,000 heads, each head having as many mouths, each mouth as many tongues, and each tongue as many sayings, and together with his suit of 70,000 myriads of angels made of white fire, praised and extolled the Lord. These said Metatron to Moses. Metatron is another one of these tall angels. Are called Erulim, and they are appointed over the grass, the trees, the fruits, the grain, but as soon as they have done the will of their creator, they return to the place assigned to them and praise God. Then he goes on to say that this, let me see here. Oh, in response to the question from Moses, Metatron told him that they presided over the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and other celestial bodies, all of them intoned songs before God. In this heaven, Moses noticed all the two great planets, Venus and Mars, each as large as the whole earth. Concerning these, he asked unto what purpose they had created. Metatron explained thereupon that Venus lies upon the sun to cool him off in summer. Venus, the planet, goes over and lays on the sun to cool him off. Else he would scorch the earth, and Mars lies upon the moon to impart warmth to her, lest she freeze the earth. Does that sound ridiculous? Well, that's where this... That's where this doctrine of the fallen angels comes from, or the fallen angels intermarrying. Uh, man, I've got to give you this other thing if I can find it. All right. It sounds, this guy, who are, these guys that wrote this, they sound like science fiction writers, like Mary said. All right, hold on a second here. I've got one here, one article. It talks about the... Uh, these fallen angels, one of them has, uh, it has thighs that has so many L's, E-L-L-S, that it's about 75 feet around the thigh, one thigh. This is where all of this legendary stuff comes from, from the Jews. You can look at these. I've got seven volumes. I just brought four of them with me just to introduce you to them. That is a fairy tale. Has anybody ever heard these theologians preach that the fallen angels intermarried with women and they were the, they were the 
that the sons of God were fallen angels. Has anybody heard that? They, that is a very popular doctrine that the sons of God in Genesis 6 is demons or fallen angels intermarrying with women. And it's utterly outrageous. It's ridiculous. It, you have to have an imagination to believe that these gigantic angels that are like 11,000 feet, 11,200 feet tall, don't want to leave the 200 feet off, 11,200 feet high. Now, here's a book on the history of the devil. This man is Paul Karras. He calls himself a theologian of many religions. He studies all these different religions, what they believe through the centuries, what they believe back in the first century. He is a, he's a doctor, Ph.D. He researched, doesn't even call himself a Christian, just says he researched all the culture of the ancient world to see what they believed that demons were. And when you open the book, he immediately, in this second chapter, goes right into the gods of Egypt. Set the nefarious demon of death and evil in Egypt. He is conceived as the sun that kills with the arrows of heat, and the iron is called the bones of Typhon. He goes right into the gods of the ancient world because he says these were the demons of the world, and he's looking at this from a sociologist's viewpoint. That's what they said in history. When you study history, you'll know what they said demons were. Then let me give you just a couple of comments out of this entire book. Very interesting stuff. Let me see what I want to read to you here. Oh, by the way, Lilith, L-I-L-I-T-H, Lilith was said to be queen of the demons. Now let me show you why Lilith would be queen of the demons. Lilith was also said to be Adam's first wife. Adam's first wife. And you're going to find that in mythology. It's, uh, that's, what, that's not what I said. That's what You'll get that out of nearly every source you go into where they study in mythology in the ancient world. It's myth. Let me show you why that. Queen of the demons. Queen of demons was Lilith. Now, it was also said that Lilith was Adam's first wife. Well, Adam, in a sense, had two wives. He had Eve before the fall and Eve after. The fall. You understand what I'm saying? He had Eve in her innocence, and she is the one that looked at the tree and began to distribute fortunes. Right? She began to take of the tree that God said, Shalt Thou shalt not. And Eve saw in the tree all that's in the world, all in the world, John, 1 John 2 16, 17, all in the world. And remember, demon, daemonion, and Lilith was a demon, a daemonion, that was going to distribute fortunes. That was in the tree. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and a pride of life. Eve saw a tree that was good for food, fulfilled the lust of the flesh, it was pleasant to the eye, fulfilled the lust of the eye, and would make her wise, and she could be proud in all of her conceits. This is the fortunes of the world that, in a sense, as the first wife distributed to Adam, and when she fell, she became a sinner. And the first wife is the way, the way mythology more or less writes this out, that this first wife, or the first side of Eve, the innocent side of Eve, looked at the tree and distributed to Adam. And all of your mythology writers will tell you Lilith was Adam's first wife. Do you understand what I just said? 
That's amazing. And he goes into this, talks about, let me see here, there's a couple of things I want to read to you. Cain was the product of Adam and Eve coming together when they saw that they were naked because God tells Eve, when you look, look over here, go back, to, go back to Genesis, the third chapter. Look at Genesis, the third chapter. Genesis 3. How much time do I have, Mike? Eight minutes. Oh, goodness, I thought I had more than that. Go back to Genesis, the third chapter. We don't believe in demons here, and we do not believe demons are fallen angels. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> if you believe it, you need to take a second look at this. Stop just saying, well, I'm believing what some professor said. Professors are messed up on this theology. Now look here in Genesis, the third chapter. And God is speaking to the serpent in the garden in verse 15 of the third chapter. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy of a Messiah in the Bible. That Christ is going to come and bruise the heel, bruise the head of the serpent. Even when you look in McLennick and Strong and look up Krishna. Krishna is... One of the gods of India, and he's got a cobra wrapped around his neck. He's got the tail wrapped around his neck. And he's got his heel upon his head. In all mythology, you're going to find the corruption of this right here. He says, I'll put enmity. And this is why, because of this verse right here, all the women, all through, all the women that were connected to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the women wanted to have children. They wanted to have a baby because they thought maybe I will be the one where the Messiah will come from. That's even why Tamar seduced her father-in-law, Judah, in the 38th chapter of Genesis, because there was no seed left of Judah, and the scepter will not depart from Judah, and she knew, as a righteous woman, she had to keep that lineage going. So she went out and posed as a prostitute and had... Judah impregnator. And it was a righteous thing because he would not give his surviving son, his last surviving son to her. He'd given two of them and they had died or God had killed them. But he didn't give the last one. She said, you won't give the last one? And this was a righteous thing that she did to keep the seed of Judah going. And it all goes back to here, back to this verse. Because all the women knew. This is the same reason... <clears throat> when Lot left, when Lot leaves Sodom and Gomorrah, his two daughters took him up into a cave and seduced their father, got him drunk and seduced him, not for sexual reasons, but hoping, since Lot was Abraham's nephew, that the Messiah would come through them. And they end up with Ben-Ami, and short for Ben-Ami was Ammon, the land of Ammon is northern Jordan, and Moab, that's southern Jordan. And they kept thinking, well, maybe the Messiah will come out of us. Anytime you see a woman wanting to have children, whether it was Rachel, give me a son. Hannah, Samuel's mother, or Samson's mother. Maybe the Messiah will come out of this lineage. They didn't understand it fully. So... This is God talking to Satan. I'll put enmity or to the serpent between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. The word conception is heron, H-E-R-O-W-N. Pregnancy, you're already pregnant. That pregnancy you have in you right now, you see, that's why when they saw each other early in this chapter and they were naked, they had to have taken each other because she's pregnant right here. He said, I'll multiply your pregnancy. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. 
And then she thinks that that baby came from God when she has that baby in chapter 4, verse 1. Adam and Eve knew, Adam knew his wife Eve. It doesn't mean that's the place and point in time he knew her. Knew means to have an intimate relationship. That had happened previously earlier in the third chapter. He's simply repeating it. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived in bare Cain, and she said, this is her words, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She didn't say it came from Adam. That's why he's not numbered a mamzer, M-A-M-Z-E-R, a bastard son, was not numbered in the family. And Cain wasn't numbered in the family, so his children are going to be sons of God, sons of men, and daughters of men. Son of God meant you can trace your lineage all the way back to God. Cain was a bastard son. That's why he wasn't a son of God. That's why he did not do the will of the Father. To be a son of someone, you have to do that will. No, I don't believe that fallen angels are... I don't believe that at all, that they're demons. Good grief. That is, it doesn't fit anywhere. Now, where was I? Oh, I was reading something out here. Listen to this. This is a man that did just clinical research. Just listen. The Greek gods were regarded as demons by early Christians. They called Hercules a demon. If demons are real, and this is not out of one source, this is all over the Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion, particularly in the spirits and demons section. The Christians called the gods, remember Acts, the 17th chapter, remember that? Paul goes to Athens, and when he gets to Athens, notice what they say what these pagans say to him. In Acts 17 chapter, Acts 17, then certain, verse 18, then certain that philosophers and Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered Paul, and some said, what will this babbler say? And others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange, it says gods, but the word is daemonion. You see, they interchanged the word demon and God. Demons were gods and gods were demons in the ancient world. If you believe in demons, you have to believe that Hercules was a real person. If you believe in demons, you have to believe that Jupiter was a real God. If you believe in demons, you've got to believe that Venus really lived and that she's out there somewhere because those were the demons of the Daemonion. May the gods go with you. May the demons go with you. But the ideas which found expression in mythology of Greece and the tale of Greek deities and heroes were retained and Christianized. They took those tales and Christianized them and brought them into the church. The old Greek saviors simply changed names and became Christian saints or at least contributed important features to the legends of their lives. A couple of, let me just see. I'm out of time. They talk about hell in here. Uh, baptism was regarded as an expulsion of an evil spirit. Does blood baptism get rid of self? Yeah, it does. See, there's a certain amount of parallel in all this. People that believe in demons, they haven't researched it and studied it. History of the Devil by Paul Karras. These, when you study false doctrine, you have to study the culture of where it came from. And you're going, when you read in the intro or the preface of these books, it will tell you that all this imaginary, legendary, these legends comes out of the halakha of the Jews. It was rabbinic imagination. It was tales that they told. It's not true. When they had that first blood baptism, where God covered Adam and Eve? Yeah, well, that got rid of the demon of self, didn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, later on, they, God gives them the instructions later. I've run out of time. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Thank you for your word. Help us to see these things, Lord. It's very frustrating, God, to research all this and then men just want to argue and just throw it, cast it down, Lord. I pray that you'll open the eyes of the elect, cause them to see truth. God will praise and glorify you for all things. Leads to your elect, in Christ's name, amen.